Welcome to Talking with Tech, presented by Speech Science. My name is Lucas Stuber, and I'm here with Rachel Madel. How are you, Rachel? I'm fantastic. It's actually raining here in LA. It's raining in LA, and it's actually sunny and like 45 degrees in Portland. I, I'm excited though to to get down to LA. What a week from tomorrow, I think. Um, That's right. Yeah, I should mention. And we, for those of you listening, we hope to see a lot of you there. Uh, if you make sure to follow us on on Facebook at Speech Science. Um, and one thing we're going to be doing is walking around the convention hall and doing some live broadcasting and, and those sorts of things. And I'm definitely going to make a point of uh, planting myself somewhere to, to meet folks. And uh, hopefully, Rachel, you'll have time to do that too. I will be there. I'm really excited. It was in Philly last year, which is my hometown. Uh, and now it's in LA, which is where I live. So Asha just keeps following me everywhere. I was going to say it's following you around. You know, I Philly last year, I saw the Liberty Bell, but I never got a cheesesteak. I feel like I really missed oh, out. Man, you really missed out. That's like our <laughs> claim to fame. But speaking of travel, so I'm really excited um, by today's interview. So we have Ajit Narayanan on who is... Um, the, you know, really the, the first person who tackled AAC in India, where there's, you know, something like 2000 speech language pathologists for a billion people. So, um, that's, a, that's, that's, that's a huge challenge that he, he undertook. And that's something that he did after coming from Silicon Valley. And, um, it's something that's near and dear to my heart because I've also, you know, done work outside of the United States and, and seen what huge opportunity there is there, not just for augmented communication, but SLP generally. And Rachel, I know you have as well. Yeah, I'm really excited. Um, you know, Ajit, in his interview, he really pointed to a lot of the challenges that, you know, he faced when he was in India and kind of the differences between practicing and technology and you know, in another country and in the United States. And I was just recently in Cambodia last year helping implement some AAC um, for a country who doesn't even have speech therapy really as a recognized profession. That's what this organization is working towards doing. And, you know, we, we take for granted all of the resources that we have in this country. And it's just not like that in other parts of the world. So. Right. Right. And, you know, there's plenty of opportunities here, too, for improvement. But I um, couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> well, as always, we want to hear from you. So make sure to give us an email. You can reach us at tech at speech science.org. That's T-E-C-H tech at speech science.org. Or give us a call at 503-345-6740. We'd love to hear about your experiences, um, not just about augmentative communication, because we're, we're getting started with this awesome new podcast, but also about, um, you know, your experiences internationally. Nationally. We'd love to hear about um, about your work or where you're located. But without further ado, um, let's uh, let's get going here and share our conversation with Ajit Narayanan. Welcome back once again to Talking with Tech. This is Lucas Stuber, accompanied as always by Rachel Madel. Hello. And joined today by my my good friend and fantastic innovator in the field of augmentative communication, Ajit Narayanan. I'm all the way from Chennai, India. How are you, sir? Hey, doing very well, Lucas. Doing very well. I'm a big fan of the podcast, and I'm I'm glad to be on it. I we're 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 so honored to have you here today. Um, this is this is fantastic, and I'm glad that it it worked out. We're we're operating, as I'm sure uh, listeners you might guess, that on a little bit of a time difference here today. So um, hopefully, some of us are waking up, and some of us are falling asleep, and uh, in the middle <laughs> we will meet. Um, but. Um, yeah. We'll we'll just you know sort of let this conversation flow because I, there's a lot going on. Um, you know, I, with what Ajit does, um, I, I do need to disclose right away that um, he and I have worked together professionally in the past on an app called Free Speech. But um, this interview really has nothing to do with with that relationship. So, Ajit, if you could tell us a little bit about um, what brought you into the the special education world and and what you've created. Um, sure, sure, Lucas. Um, I used to live and work in. Um, uh, in, in the San Francisco Bay Area for many years. I've been exposed to the tech world really from, from the inside out. And um, about 2007, um, I, I'd been in the US for about five years. I decided that I wanted to do something um, of a more social uh, entrepreneurship nature than, than high technology. And so I decided to move back to India, which I did in 2007, and uh, start I started volunteering at a school for children with special needs uh, in the city of Chennai, where I live. And um, at that point of time, the penetration of technology into special education was rather primitive uh, anywhere in the world. And in India, 
is pretty much non-existent. So um, the first thing that uh, that that uh, people at the school asked me to do uh, as soon as I, I I told them I'd like to start volunteering with them is that they wanted me to start looking at making an AAC um, device for children with uh, cerebral palsy and autism uh, for people here in India. Now, um, at that point of time, of course, there were already devices that were available around the world. Um, you know, they have been available for a few decades now, but nothing at a price point that would have worked in India, nothing at a price point of less than $5,000. And in India, I think really the price that would have worked was one tenth of that. Um, so I started building my own AAC device. And it was still a device at that point of time. I mean, the iPhone had just come out in 2007. And uh, we saw that the smartphone revolution was just around the corner. Uh, tablets still hadn't, um, hadn't come out. That hadn't happened yet. But I, I could see that at least the electronics, the technology that was driving the electronics of any of these smartphones was going to be, um, was, was going to drive costs down dramatically. So we were able to use some of the off-the-shelf electronic components that, that go into smartphones to build our own um, AAC device. And that was in 2000, I mean, we, we, we worked through all of 2008 uh, to be able to do that. And in 2009, uh, the first version of it came out. And that was Avaaz, and that, that was really the start of the Avaaz story. Um, in 2010, the iPad came out, and as soon as the iPad came out, we saw that that would be a much more sustainable platform for us to use, uh, just because we, we wouldn't have to deal with you know, manufacturing electronics at such small volumes. So we went ahead and we um, converted Avaaz into an app. I think we were one of the first AC apps on the iPad, um, and, and it was an immediate success. Um, not just in India, where we, we had targeted the device, but really all over the world. Um, the, that app was the starting point into really um, almost a decade of exploring the special education market for me. Uh, we started by building Amaz, uh, but, but we went from there to a whole bunch of other things. Uh, we, we started realizing that we had to do support for you know, parental support for AAC intervention, uh, we developed an interest in uh, the underlying fundamentals of language and that resulted in the free speech app. And, um, and yeah, we, we, we are continuing to explore new directions in communication and language learning for people with disabilities around the world. That's fantastic. Well, and, and to, you know, for our listeners and, um, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot and make you, make you blush and everything, but, you know, Ajit, you've, you've given a, a TED talk about your work on, on free speech. You were, you know, recognized by MIT as one of the what thirty five under thirty five uh, innovators. Um, so this is this work has really has not gone unrecognized, right? I mean, this has been um, a, a pretty powerful, I think, journey. Um, not yeah. only not only for you, but for the community generally. Um, and and one thing that we're often asked uh, is is about the AAC community internationally. Like, what what would you say has been um, the biggest difference for you developing for the U.S. market versus India or other other places? Well, um, as you mentioned, Lucas, we've been quite lucky in the fact that we've um, received a number of awards and recognitions around the world. I think one that is particularly special to me was one that we got in 2010, which was right after Avaaz went commercial. I mean, we, we, we launched a prototype in 2009 and we, we were, um, we, we, we just started marketing the product and boom, right there, a few months after we launched the product, we got... Um, what's really the highest award in India for people working in the disability space. It's called the National Award for Empowerment of Persons with Disabilities and it's, it's, it's awarded by the President of India. So I got my um, audience with the President of India a few months uh, <laughs> after we developed Aval. And it was always a source of some bafflement about how, how very quickly that, that came about because um, Avaaz was really the first time that AAC had been introduced in India in, in any meaningful way. But the people that, that did that committee, they, 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 the people on that committee that selected me for the award, um, at some point of time, they, they decided to explain to me why that happened. And, and, and what was surprising was that it looked like what drove that award more than anything else was the fact that uh, 
immediately, almost immediately as soon as Avaaz was in the market, we started seeing awareness about these disabilities um, shoot up. So I, I think that's the fundamental difference. In America, there's been a culture of AAC and assistive technology for at least 30 years now. And the people that started um, using AAC 30 years ago, today they are um, you know, confident, contributing individuals in society, and they are the role models really for the rest of uh, the disability community to look up to and say, look, if you give the right kind of technology to the to a person with disabilities, they can they can live just as fulfilling a life as you and I can. In India, that that part of the puzzle was missing for for for, for the for the longest period of time, and um, we we had we had some very uh, we, we had some pretty tragic stories of you know going into 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 smaller towns and going into smaller cities and and, and you know, uh, meeting parents of people with disabilities who did not know the difference between cerebral palsy and autism and mental retardation. Uh, they they would they would they would assume that just because a child has a mental disability, they have no capability to think or no capability to communicate, uh, which which is which is patently wrong, as as you know. Uh, but the, they had no way to know better because there was no one in India that was using um, an assistive technology for people with disabilities and you know, for people with, with mental disabilities and who had uh, a data, who had to contribute a data point that proved otherwise. So with Avaaz, even the first few sales of the device in the country were disproportionately impactful because um, even though it did not drive adoption in a dramatic way in the first few months, it did drive aspiration. And when, when we were able to take videos of some of these kids who were using our, our product and we were able to show that to a broader audience. The immediate feedback was, you know, the immediate thought in the minds of many of these parents was, oh wow, my kid can do that as well if they have the right technology. So I, I think that, that was the fundamental difference between making this product for the Indian market versus making this product for other markets. Um, that's, yeah, I, I'd say that's the fundamental thing. I think, Ajit, that you brought up such a really valid point. Um, you know, we tend, not we as speech therapists of us, but, you know, there's a perception that lack of communication is lack of intelligence. And it, you know, giving the people of India, you know, with these cognitive delays and developmental delays, you know, the ability to communicate in ways that they weren't able to kind of um, demystified that premise so that's really it's really awesome yes yes in fact um, I, I think it it was a it, it was something that was absolutely necessary for us to do in India but it's paid uh, it's paid dividends in our development of Avas even for other countries you know including America um, mm -hmm. I mean Lucas knows a little bit about this because we've been on some part of this journey together but for example, um, a need that is very specific to India is that you do need to get speech, you know, there are, there are only 1,800 speech therapists in all of India. That's an incredibly wow. shocking number. A, a, yes. a relatively small town in America will have 1,800. That's wild, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So you guys will be in, in incredibly heavy demand if you decide to move to India at some point. But, uh, <laughs> oh, that's, that's actually very, quite, that's very tempting. Other than yeah. other than the uh, the traffic noises I hear behind you, that's, that's very know. tempting. Sounds very busy. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. It's Monday morning. No, no. But, uh, the, the the fact of the matter is that with so few therapists to support a disability community, um, the a lot of the onus is on parents, you know, and and so a lot of the the, the features that we developed for Avas were really to help parents become the primary caregiver of the child and and really to become. Um, almost uh, the therapist of the child in some sense. Now, uh, we designed these features for the Indian market, but obviously everywhere in the world, the, the greater the involvement of parents in, in, um, in helping their kids with AAC intervention, the better it is for everyone involved, you know, for the parents, for the kids, for the community, for the, for the teacher, for the therapist. So a lot of those features are becoming very popular outside of India as well. And that's, that's I think that's the story uh, being told again and again with the development of Avaaz. 
Uh, we see the needs in certain parts of the world that require specific features and more often than not those features turn out to be incredibly useful, uh, not just in that country, but really around the world. I uh, want to circle back for just a second. So you volunteered in a special needs school. What motivated you to do that? Uh, it's an interesting question. I, I, I don't really have a very um, uplifting answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> the only answer that I have is that I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I came back to India. Um, I knew I wanted to start up. So I, I, was, I was just a guy with a crazy dream. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I knew I wanted to start up. I wanted to build a company of my own. Um, that, that was, you know, volunteering at, at that special school was one of four or five different things that I did. Um, okay. I, I was, yeah, I was experimenting with, you know, working with, um, uh, with, with milk, with dairy farmers, to do, you know, to do some stuff on their supply line. I, I was experimenting with, with, with a whole bunch of other areas. Um, but this was the one that, that seemed to strike a chord among the different things that I tried. So uh, I found my calling. I, I knew nothing about disability before I started working in that special school. Wow. But I, I found calling within the first first few days that I was, um, I, I was interacting with the kids there. That's amazing. And then you went on to have an amazing TED Talk. I was just watching it. 27 languages it's been translated into. 1.2 million views. Um, and I, I, I want to touch on, you know, something you talk about in that talk. Um, mm -hmm. You talk about abstraction, which is so difficult for children with autism. Um, can you just explain to our listeners a little bit about, you know, what that means and, and, why, and, and why free speech was developed to kind of help remediate that? Absolutely. Um, and obviously, you know, when we talk about people, children with autism, we're talking about a spectrum, and I assume most of your listeners know that. So, so what I'm saying perhaps relates to the more severe end of the spectrum than the, the high-functioning end of the spectrum. But um, one, um, one ability that children with autism sometimes lack is the ability to generalize and the ability to... And that, that impacts both their social interaction and their communication capability and sometimes their imagination as well. Yeah. So um, if, you think about, if you think about spoken language, you think about oral and written language, the fundamentals of it is really all about symbolism, right? Um, mm -hmm. we, we pick an arbitrary, apparently arbitrary set of sounds, like the set of sounds that come together to create the word water. And that set of sounds has nothing to do with the word that it represents. I mean, if, if I was to tell the word water to somebody that didn't know English, they would have no idea that it represents um, the liquid substance. So that's a completely symbolic um, act of creating words and, and using sequences of sounds or sequences of alphabets to represent those words. Now, it seems that there is some magic that happens in the brain that allows us at a very young age to be able to pick up that symbolism and then to be able to deploy that symbolism almost effortlessly in being able to learn and use words um, as part of our language learning. Um, for children with disabilities like autism, that seems to be an area of mental development that's substantially um, less capable than it is for typically developing children. And we don't know the reason why, and we don't know the extent of it, but that seems to be the, uh, one, of the, one of the things that differentiates uh, the, the language development of children with autism from others. Now, we developed AMAs really as a continuation of many decades of research into using pictures for communication. And, and you know, uh, the ability to use a picture to represent a word makes the cognitive barrier so much lower for a child with autism to access words, to access vocabulary. But if you think about it, that's only one small part of creating language uh, to be able to know the right words. And I, I, I know this, you know, I, I tried to learn Japanese this before I made a trip to Japan. And when I went there, I knew maybe a hundred different words, but I, I didn't have the skills to put together a single sentence. Because to put together a sentence is so much more difficult than to be able to learn the words. You're sp uh, yes, I could not agree more. I'm just like, this is, these are the kids that I work with. So I specialize in kids with autism and 
right. they have a lot of nouns. So they know a lot of nouns that are very concrete, but anything that's abstract, verbs, prepositions, um, they just have such a, ter- a terrible time. And they're stuck because they can't put words into sentences. So they might have a vocabulary of nouns, but they're not, they're not able to create meaningful communication out of it. Yes, absolutely. And if you think about it, the process of words coming together to create sentences is, is, is almost voodoo. It's, it's mysterious. It's magical. It seems to yeah. have no uh, rules to it. Uh, you know, the, why do you say I want to go instead of saying I want to go? I mean, yeah. I, I had a kid who, who asked me, what's the meaning of the word too? And I, it, it took me forever to, <laughs> and then I realized I, I don't know what's the meaning of the word too. <laughs> it's something that you say to make exactly. uh, grammatically correct sentences. And mm-hmm. that's how grammar is, right? I mean, it's, it's full of all kinds of um, crazy rules and conventions that have evolved over time. Yeah. And uh, to explain that to a child uh, who's struggling with words, who's struggling with understanding what verbs are, what prepositions are, you know, what's the difference between you know, an on and an under and an over. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, just, it's just incredibly difficult. So that was the motivation for free speech. Um, even though children would, it's, it's not difficult today with the technology we have today to give children a fairly extensive and useful vocabulary. Um, true communication happens when that vocabulary is converted into sentences of of increasing complexity. We, we could not have this interview if we were communicating in single words. It, it's simply impossible. You can't express complicated thoughts with single words. That's what the infrastructure of grammar provides. Mm-hmm. And so the development of free speech was, I mean, it's, it's simply, I, I've often wondered what the evolution of language was from the perspective of, well, language had a certain path of evolution. And I imagine the complexity of human thought uh, drove that. But which came first? I, I have no idea. I, I imagine it, it's, it's, it wouldn't have been possible for the early human beings to come up with complicated sentences and to come up with philosophical ideas before they built the language infrastructure for that. And if we want children with disabilities to have access to the same heritage of thought and uh, you know, the same ability to communicate abstract things, we do need to give them the ability to be able to create rich, complex sentences with the entire grammatical faculty. Uh, provided as a specific technology. So that, that was really the foundation for free speech. Can you actually, um, so Avaz is a speech generating device. Um, can you actually tell our listeners what free speech is? Uh, free speech is, um, is, is, a, is, a, is an app that supports children who are using AAC with the ability to sequence words together to create sentences. So you could think of it as a language development tool for children with uh, children who use AAC. It's not an AAC app, uh, but it's an app that could be used in conjunction with your favorite AAC app to help build uh, grammar skills and language skills. From a, from a practical standpoint, it's an excellent way to teach actually WH questions. I really like using that because you, that app does a great job of kind of leading you down the path of sentence formulation. Um, right. But at the same time, it's targeting WH questions to figure out what do you exactly want to say? Yes, that's, um, it's very gratifying that you find it useful for that particular dimension. That, that's certainly one of the key things that we had in mind when we created the app. Um, actually, when we, when we constructed, when we created free speech, uh, Lucas and I worked on this together. So uh, we, we'd gone through a whole bunch of research um, that covers how children with disabilities are taught um, language skills. And when, when we talk about language skills, we specifically mean skills like morphology, so understanding the difference between different kinds of words. Why do you say eat in certain cases and eating in certain cases and so on. Uh, sentence structure, so why do you put the verb before the object and after the subject in, in most cases, but you reverse that sometimes in the case of questions and so on. Um, so, you know, the use of special words, the word stop words like to and off and, and the and um, you know, uh, words like that. So these are, these are things that, that speech therapists have been trying to tackle for, for many, many years now. Um, and we did find a, a body of research that has, that covers some of the techniques that, that, that speech therapists use to do these things. And one of the techniques, of course, is prompting. So if, if a child was to say, 
you know, just out of the blue, say the word jump. A speech therapist might then get them to expand on that particular word by asking them questions, by saying, you know, who jumped and, you know, jump where and jump when and things like that. So that, that, was, a, that, that was one of the motivations for us to actually build Free Speaks the way it is. Uh, essentially, you start by selecting words from a picture vocabulary the way that you would do from any AAC app. But the secret sauce in free speech is that when you put some words onto, onto the screen, free speech will automatically prompt you to expand on that particular word by asking you questions that you can answer to build uh, bigger and more complicated sentences. And the secret sauce uh, is complemented by this algorithm that we built that takes that series of question and answers, uh, those pairs of question and answers, and then it's able to crunch that and it's able to then give you a perfectly grammatical sentence in English that conveys the meaning that those uh, question answer pairs represent. So there is this incredibly powerful grammar prediction that happens within, you know, within free speech. And a combination of that grammar prediction plus that uh, ability to prompt with contingent queries, uh, I think that gives it uh, almost an unparalleled uh, mechanism to have children dramatically increase their mean length of utterance by making more and more complicated sentences, which you can model and which you can prompt and which you can expose a child to. Yeah, to me, it's, it's a way of, it's in many ways, well, they, I, I'm trying to be quiet here, actually, because obviously I did play a part in the development and I don't want uh, our listeners to think that this podcast is, is about that role, but um you know, it facilitates. Lucas, you, you were a big part of it. You, we built it together. We were, <laughs> we were a two-member tag team to build that product together. So don't don't hide your light. Under no, no, that's 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 very that's very very <laughs> kind of you. I I, I just. Um, Yes, that's very kind. And, and um, uh, there was an incredible team uh, there and, and these things. And, and my role really was um, was the clinical application. And, and I recall one one time specifically that, that led me to believe that one thing that we had done is sort of inadvertently allowed children who, in the absence of oral, oral language, then still had the ability to sort of babble with language, if that makes any sense. Um, and so there was, there was one child in particular where he started with the word water. And then he, he was continued to be prompted by the app, and he constructed this this very long sentence. And this was a, a five year old with no oral language, um, who who told me there was too much water at the airport. And um, and I remember thinking at the time this was during development. I was I was kind of like, oh, he's just playing. He he ended up playing with the words like that's you know, I, I, I'm not sure if this is functional. And then I was talking to his his mother after our session, and she, she said that yeah, we were at the airport to pick up his father yesterday, and and the bathroom was flooded. Oh wow! And um. It, it was this incredible moment of oh my gosh! I just we facilitated some some something incredibly functional there that um, wasn't present and and I didn't I didn't interpret it correctly initially right but that um, goes back to the comment that you made about uh, about in India that you know the relative poverty of speech therapists and these other things that one of the one of the things that we and I mean the royal we all of us in the field uh, need to do better is in um, you know, empowering, empowering intervention and education among, uh, among parents and, and among clinicians even, and these other things. And to have that, the pedagogy and the instructional you know, context of these apps embedded within it. And I know that one thing that, that you and your team did was, was build communication adventures um, and a lot of these other tools. Uh, and even within Avaz, uh, you know, when you first start the app, um, you know, the, the core Avaz speech generating app, there's a, a real guided process that happens there. Um, which you don't you don't see in other apps. You know, it'll ask how old is your child? Do they use two words together? Right. right. What is their visual acuity? These other things. Um, and then you also right. have things like uh, visual feedback on um, on icon selection, and uh, you know have this, right. this gradual literacy or uh, drive towards literacy with the embedded keyboard that also is picture predicted. Um, you know, I, I guess yeah. what's interesting to me as a professional is that um, there there's a lot you know, and I don't mean this in a disparaging way at all towards, towards other folks, but there, there are a lot of folks in the industry that are still sort of catching up to things that you were doing in India, you know, now six, seven years ago. And I wonder why that is like, what, why, why have we become satisfied with the status quo or why don't we all try to do these great things? That's a tough question. Sorry. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 well, I mean, we do, see this around the world, right? We see that when, when people have limited resources and they have to innovate with limited resources, they 
perhaps they think outside the box. And I, I think it's just completely, it completely, it completely talks to that about why we had to focus so much on Twitter. Yeah, necessity is the mother of invention, uh, we, right? We simply could sure. not sell. Yeah, yeah, we we could not sell our app in India without empowering parents to be able to use it because you know we had so so few speech therapists. Um, but it, it it's I mean when we found out that um, when we started talking about these features to an American audience, you know, and 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 um, you know this is at all of the conferences that we've attended, right? Uh, closing the gap and APIA and ASHA and all of these different places, and we meet therapists and we meet parents and we we show them what we've done. We do find that some of those concerns resonate. It may not be the number one priority to an American market, but it's certainly uh, uh, an incredibly useful thing to have, even for people in America. And there are a couple of reasons that I, I, I I've been able to glean why why that's useful. The first is that therapists who are not necessarily AAC experts, and that's simply just because maybe you know in their caseload there may be one or two children that that need AAC. You have more technology than any engineer that I know, so <laughs> and maybe that's not representative. But uh, I mean, don't tell my wife. <laughs> uh, I think my um, my observation was that a lot of the features that we put in for parents are actually pretty useful for therapists as well. I mean, therapists do have to cope with um, a constantly changing field um, when it comes to AAC. There is new apps with new features introduced every year. And it's really hard for even the most tech savvy of therapists to stay on top of all of the new stuff that's happening in the field. So um, that was one very interesting um, data point that we found, which is that therapists in a, in America use a lot of our parent uh, parental guidance tools to really get a hang of the app themselves. One thing that you know uh, I'm sure you remember is that we have we have this incredible section of our app that's completely devoted to modeling. And the theory behind that is that for you to be able to get a child to be able to communicate with their AAC device, you have to know their AAC device inside out. And this is particularly true if you are the primary caregiver. You have to be able to use the child's language, uh, in, in this particular case, the child's AAC app, to be able to communicate with the child so that the child uh, is, able to, um, is able to play that back to you as a successful example of modeling. And we have this entire section in the app that's related to modeling, right? So you can you can you can pick any sentence you want to in the app. You can put in any sentence you want to communicate, and the app will teach you how to model that sentence on the app itself. So it'll 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 prompt you with where to go to search for the right kinds of words and all of that stuff. And that that was that's something that we see. Actually, the demand for that didn't come from parents; it came from therapists who have to switch between you know three or four different apps yeah. uh, for three or four different children on their caseload, and they may not really know the layout of the vocabulary in these apps out of the box. So it's incredibly useful for them to have that, that tool. Right. And, um, and the second, the second driving factor there was also the fact that, I mean, a therapist at the end of the day spends one hour, two hours a week with a kid, a parent spends a hundred hours a week with a kid. And so obviously if you can make the, the kid, the kids AAC experience at home, even 1% more effective, um, that adds, that's, that's the equivalent of making, you know, the therapist experience a hundred percent more effective just because the numbers stack up that way. And, and we, we know this from research, right? That the, the, the two biggest predictors of success are training of the, the child's circle of support, the broader circle of support, family, and caregivers, and everyone else. And then also effective absolutely. modeling and native language stimulation. Absolutely. Right? So absolutely. And, and, and we do see this in practice as well, right? We see that the best therapists do spend a substantial amount of their time talking to parents and getting the parents and the special educators that support the child to extend the use of language outside of the therapy session as well. So they may spend 40 minutes with the child and 20 minutes with the child's caregivers to be able to continue the use of that therapy, you know, through aided language stimulation, through, through various other things, uh, so that the child has this kind of this multiplier effect for language development. So, um, yeah, so I mean, all of that is built on very sound science and very sound um, underlying principles. Yeah, you can hear the monsoon. Is it was that I, I thought I heard thunder here. Yeah, well, wow. Well, it's uh, it's Monsoon it's about forty one degrees and thinking about snowing tomorrow in Portland. So if if that makes you feel any better. <laughs>
Yeah, this is the this is the fun part of the year for us. Uh, monsoon started yesterday, and it's going to be raining continuously for the next fifteen days. So uh, it's it's wet weather. And I, I do I recall working uh, with you over the last few years, and and having some times when I would I would try to contact the office, and you're all saying the road there's no roads. <laughs> <It's just water. laughs> yeah. So yeah, Ajit, I'd love to know what's what's next. What's on the horizon? Well, uh, Rachel, I, th I think. Uh, you, you know that we're living in exciting times uh, with respect to assistive technology in general, not just yes. AAC. And maybe, I, I mean, I, I'd love to spend a few minutes just, you know, brainstorming about where we see, it, you know, assistive technology in general headed. Um, I, I think that would be a really interesting, a really interesting conversation to have. I, I'm seeing a few trends, and, and maybe you guys can chime in with whether you're seeing those trends the same way that I'm seeing them as well. Um, the first is that I am seeing um, over the last few years an increasing um, tendency to use commercial off-the-shelf off equipment for um, AC, you know, for, for assistive technology purposes rather than custom-built stuff. And we're seeing, I, I think we're going to see that explode over the next few years. You know, you, you have you have VR, you have AR, uh, you have handheld devices, you have wearable devices, you have robotics. Um, and all of these things, of course, are being built for a consumer audience. They're being built for, uh, you know, people to use for entertainment and gaming and all of that stuff. But what's incredibly exciting is that this technology, if it had been built for special education specifically, would have been 10 times the cost and uh, with a much, much smaller pool of developers building applications on top of it. So I am seeing that that is the way forward for assistive technology, uh, that the bulk of assistive technology is going to be built on top of um, consumer technology and that's that's a very interesting uh, way of looking at innovation so it's no longer about you know innovation in assistive technology the way I see it is no longer about building new devices it's about finding really innovative uses for existing technology that's being repurposed for assistive technology use um, oh, you're, you're speaking my language. That's I, so I agree so much. And this goes back to the piece of what we would call UDL or UDA, like universal design for learning or universal design for access that, you know, right. we have, we have companies like the apples of the world or the Googles that will spend, you know, a billion dollars looking at user interface design and how we want to interact with, with touchscreens. And frankly, historically, we have then in our field sort of ignored all of it, <laughs> you know, and, and just built our right. own thing. And, you know, so I, I have this very strong belief that, it, um, you know, can, can consumer electronics in a very general sense or, or, or even just, um, you know, access like, like the, you know, the relative proliferation of, of text to speech and, and these other things that are being used in schools. Like, I think that's going to happen in our field. And, um, and I don't think that's a bad thing. It's not like we've somehow missed the boat and, and not competed, right? We've, we've helped to drive this, this forward and hopefully can continue to, to guide the ship. And, and it's, it's interesting that you bring up um, uh, uh, VR and um, augmented reality because that's that's a big part of what Rachel's work has been recently, right? So, yeah, I um, I worked with an app developer who just released a app called Moments, um, and it's a augmented reality app that helps kids with autism. Um, mm -hmm. Essentially, it's a it's using a Merge Cube, which is a new kind of augmented reality technology, and it's just a cube you can buy you know, at Amazon or Walmart, <laughs> and you hold a device like an I iPhone or a tablet in front of it and then hold the cube and animated characters pop up. Yeah, and yeah. Um, there's six different emotions. Um, so you turn the cube and it's a different emotion. And it's really interesting. And it's just kind of opened my eyes to what technology is possible for, you know, kids with special needs. Um, I think that like you said, I think these are all kind of consumer-based technologies that are coming out. And right. if it if it wasn't that way, you know, it would be highly expensive and we wouldn't have a, you know, we would have a very small pool of developers developing these technologies. So I'm fine, like, flying on the coattails of this kind of consumer technology revolution. Yeah, if they could raise the $500 million to, to, to fund whatever, then we'll, we'll, we'll learn from their mistakes, right? And, um, you know, yes. this is something that Ajit and I have spoken about before is, is the need within our field for things like geofencing, like, you know, and, and just overall looking at the context of use uh, for a device. Um, Ajit, what do you, I mean, do, do you think that's the, the future here? What, what are your thoughts on your question? Well, I, 
I certainly think so. Um, you know, I, I um, look because you know that I've had a pretty, uh, pretty deep relationship with Apple over the years, and they've sure. been incredibly supportive of everything that we've done with assistive technology. And so I had the opportunity at, at one point of time to ask them why assistive technology was so close to their hearts, especially given that it's so niche, and Apple is such a I mean, they, they're such a popular consumer company. Uh, why do they focus on this particular niche? And the answer was actually very enlightening because, um, you know, it's apparent to me that it, it became very apparent through the course of that conversation that they were not looking at disability in the same way that you and I do. Um, if somebody is driving a car and using a cell phone, um, it's, it's a certain set of functions that are impaired at that point of time, right? You, you can't really, you, you can't really pay attention to the screen. You can't really um, use, use, you know, sure. uh, the way that you would use otherwise. And technologies that Apple builds for people with disabilities um, are incredibly powerful to repurpose for these kinds of application situations as well. And it's the same thing with, you know, people who are, um, who are, who, are, who are older and therefore who have um, less control over some, um, let's say, they, you know, somebody who, who has early onset of Parkinson's uh, would perhaps have less control over muscle movement. And the technology that you would build for somebody with cerebral palsy um, versus the technology you would build for somebody with Parkinson's is only a spectrum. And if, if you built your, if you made your, you know, your cell phone incredibly powerful for someone with um, cerebral palsy to use, a very natural and a very beautiful uh, side benefit of that is that now you have, you know, um, your cell phone becoming the preferred model for a whole, uh, you know, generation of older um, users of these devices. So it's it's almost, you know, uh, it's almost karma in a sense, right? You 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 make the you make your technology work better for people with disabilities, and the world will reward you by making your technology more usable for just people with various kinds of uh, special needs outside of the typical definition of that term, you know, the special need, maybe I need to use my cell phone when I'm driving a car and, you know, Siri will help me do that. Uh, but Siri will also help me uh, interact with my cell phone if I'm, if I'm visually impaired or if I have sure. some other kind of thing. So um, I, I think that's a beautiful way in which technology is driving um, assistive technology. And it really, it, it really, it really warms the heart at some point in time to see that the big companies investing in assistive technology is then it's then also paying off for them financially. Uh, that that makes the whole thing so much more sustainable in, in in my opinion. Yep. Well, and it reminds me of an old axiom from education that goes back to the seventies that best practices for education in in autism are best practices for education, right? Because it yeah. it reinforces things right. like structure and repetition and these other things. And I think we can generalize yes. that overall sort of philosophy to um, to technology and to access. Absolutely, and, and in fact, we are seeing that play out in real life within uh, within my company and within the work that we're doing. Because uh, one area of of particular interest for us over the last few months has been the use of free speech and the use of some technologies from Avaaz to teach children without a disability a new language. And in fact, um, we just opened an office in China a few months ago, and. Uh, one of the key um, motivations for that was to see if free speech could help children in China learn English in a, in a more effective way. And that's exactly, uh, the, the motivation for that is exactly what you're saying, because you know we, we come up with a new technology that helps children with autism learn English better. Uh, that same technology could be used for children with uh, no disabilities to, to learn English you know, far better than, than what's currently available out there. Yep. Totally. Yep. My wife is an English as a second language teacher, right? And as 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 Ajit knows, like she she uses free speech in her in her practice. And and one thing that's that's really amazing about it is that it, it manages to capture the the you know the the meaning and the function words it can be driven by the user, but then it puts in the uh, and I forget who came up with this term, but the salt and pepper words, right? It it, right. it, it sort of takes care of them for you. The the, the prepositions and all that other stuff. Uh, <laughs> You know, which yeah. often are the hardest things to learn, um, you know, as, as a language. Uh, I know. They're the, the, one, the one area that all of my kids always get confused, all those prepositions and the filler words. <laughs> yeah. Right, 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 absolutely. Well, Ajit, I, I know that, um, you know, I want to respect your time. Um, you're, you're very busy. I, I just, I can't thank you enough for speaking with us today. I think this was um, both philosophically and practically uh, one of the most rewarding conversations that we've had. So, um 
that that was great. And um, and Rachel, of of course, as always, thank you so much for your very informed questions. Um, what's uh, I, I, what what did we what didn't we ask you that you'd like to share? <laughs> I think we spoke about quite a bit, Lucas. Um, I, I just, I, maybe the one thing that I, I, I want to make a little more explicit is the fact that the development of the kind of technology that we build here at Aval, um, it's, you know, you look at a piece of assistive technology and you see the engineering, and what you don't realize is the incredible contribution of speech therapists and clinicians towards the development of this kind of technology. And, um, you know, I, I just want to close on the note that you played an incredible part in, in building um, Avas and free speech by bringing in that clinical component. So <laughs> uh, I, I'm sure there are therapists, uh, and Rachel spoke about that briefly as well, but, but you know, uh, she, she's had some very rewarding collaborations with app developers. So it, it works, uh, you know, it works incredibly well when people collaborate. And uh, maybe that's a, a great way to kind of sign off on the whole uh, motivation of, of, of this podcast as well. I, I, I keep listening to every episode of it and every episode of it just brings out that collaboration angle incredibly powerfully. So thank you guys. Thank, thank you to all of the clinicians and the therapists out there who help developers make better technology. I love that. Thank you so much for, for sharing that sentiment. And, and, you know, it just is once again, a reminder that not only does it take a village, right, to, to raise a child, but that often each of us are a village unto ourselves in terms of the, the many needs that we have. And also that when people work together, amazing things happen. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for your time. Enjoy your uh, your Monday morning traffic. And we out here will enjoy our, our Sunday evening sleep. To so everyone out there, this is Lucas Stuber for Talking With Tech with Rachel Madel and our guest, Ajit Narayanan. Uh, we hope to have you uh, here speaking with us many times again. Thank you, Lucas. Well, welcome back. Uh, again, this is Lucas Stuber with, with Rachel Madel. Just finished that fantastic conversation with, um, with Ajit. I'm not even really sure uh, where to begin with what to say about it, but I'm um, just blown away. What a thought leader, honestly. He, he was, he's so inspiring. Yeah. I mean, it's just definitely one of those, um, you know, that old axiom of if you feel like you're the, the smartest person in the room, you need to find a new room. And um, a good room to find would be one with the Jeep in it because <laughs> he's, yeah. got, he's got a lot to teach. And, and, you know, especially coming from somebody who's really has this background in software engineering to have such a masterful knowledge of, of clinical practice and of linguistics in addition is just remarkable. So um, Absolutely. very excited to have spoken with him. So um, again, uh, please share your thoughts with us. You can reach us at tech at speech science.org or give us a call at 503-345-6740. We are brand new and we're really looking forward to your feedback and hopefully your support. So um, make sure also to, to head over to iTunes um, or, or Google play or your app of choice and subscribe to the podcast. Tell your friends about us and um, we'd love to, to get some reviews as well. So, uh, you know, five stars is always fantastic, but you know, if it's less than that, just tell us what we can do better. Um, again, for, for speechscience.org and for talking with tech, this is Lucas Stuber and, and Rachel Madel. We'll talk to you next week.